for the rock stars, this is the main advice. Be consistent. Yeah. Be on time. You need to under promise and over deliver every single time. So if it takes me a week to get something done, I always tell him two weeks. And when I get it done in that week, he's like, oh man, you got this done so quick. I'm like, yeah, man, I just had some extra time. And you know, little does he know, you know, I have eight people working on it. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Today's episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is sponsored by Roswell Pro Audio, maker of handcrafted microphones in California. Inspired design and impeccable attention to detail will help you capture a gorgeous vintage sound without the vintage price tag. Check out their beautiful line of microphones at roswellproaudio.com. Hey Rockstars, it's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Kirk Teachout, a producer who was introduced to me as a dude with a large YouTube channel of nursery rhymes. Thank you to Mr. Pete Woj of MixBetterNow.com for that one. And I met Kirk at Summer NAMM 2017, where he explained to me that he had been creating content for a company that has the top 500 plus YouTube channels in the world. Kirk started out working in Memphis, Tennessee, alongside Lawrence Boo Mitchell at Royal Studios, super cool, and followed that by opening his own studio, Rise Studio, in Memphis, and the website riserecording.com. Kirk has had 10 years playing in bands and touring as well, and enjoys teaching the things he has learned along the way. He's also an excellent teacher with a strong sense of not only the musical side of recording, but the business side of growing a band or a studio. So today he's going to share with us his outline for four steps to 1.4 million Spotify plays in a year. I'm going to say that again, four steps to 1.4 million Spotify plays in a year. That is an awesome goal. You heard that right. So we're going to be sitting at the high stakes tables today. Please welcome Kirk Teachout to Recording Studio Rockstars. Kirk, my friend, are you ready to rock? Of course. Awesome, dude. How did you start out in recording? You know, I've kind of given a very brief introduction. So fill in the gaps for us a little more and tell us who you are and how you got to have so much experience with this stuff. Uh, yeah. Um, so I like like you said, I've I've been in bands most of my life, early teens or middle teens to to now, up until about a year ago. And you know, I always loved recording in those bands and being in the studio. And and it came to the point where I knew I needed something uh, long term. I didn't want to tour for the rest of my life. <laughs> for some guys, that's a thing, and they love it, and that's awesome. But I wanted to have a family, so. I wanted to figure out how I could still be involved in music, be more in the background, but still be a music creator. So I, I started just with a like a really crappy mic, um, <laughs> recording stuff in my college dorm room, and just kind of molded from there um, with free software and, and anything I could get. Guitar Hero USB mic, um, putting <laughs> two 15 watt practice amps together and playing them at the same time and trying to figure out phase issues and all sorts of stuff. Did Guitar um, Hero actually have a recording aspect or you just had the mic that would kind of work with the, the free software at that time? So later on, I think World Tour, you could actually create your own songs. So like that's how we did a lot of drums. So that before I knew about MIDI drums in the box, that's how we programmed all the drums for our record. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I had this game on PlayStation once. It was called like MTV Music or something. And it was this weird DJ game where you could kind of put blocks together and try and make music. It, it was not easy. No, no, it's not. It had a lot of painstaking hours. But yeah, so that's, I mean, that's how I got started. And I knew like I wanted to be a part of music still. And I wanted to continue on and have a family and be at home. Um, so I did that. And I went to Full Sail University um, after I was at State College, didn't really like my business degree, um, quit that and, and went to Full Sail University online, got a music production degree there, love Full Sail. Um, I got a lot, a ton of experience there, but there was a disconnect, obviously, because I was doing it online and they, don't, they can't teach you how to place a mic <laughs> over internet. So mm. I was learning the concepts 
and any way that you can make mu- music as a producer. But I was wanting to learn hands on. So I reached out to Boom Mitchell at Royal, who was the president of the Recording Academy here in Memphis at the time. I was just like, hey, I need an internship. And he was like, well, my intern just quit. So come by the studio. And so nice. I did. And, you know, we, we hit it off and I, I started working with him and uh, it really wasn't an internship. It was more of like me being his assistant. So I never cleaned the bathrooms. I, <laughs> I, I cleaned a little bit, but, but mainly I was just right behind him the whole time working on awesome sessions, working on with huge people um, and just seeing the history of, of that studio and, and just being hands-on uh, man, in the studio. Man, so you got to skip all the bathroom cleaning as an intern? That's that's like straight to the top, dude. Yeah, dude. I Well, I wrapped a ton of cables, though. I, I did wrap a ton of cables and labeled every single cable in his studio. Awesome. <laughs> so, I, mean, I, lo- I, I, I love labeling. I didn't quite <laughs> skip it. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I didn't quite skip all the intern duties, but yeah, I never cleaned the bathroom. Right, so, I right. was pretty excited about that. Well, <laughs> if you ever decide that you really missed out and you, you want to try and, you know, get some more experience with that, just... We got one here if you ever, I'm just saying, it's just an offer. <laughs> right. Right. Um, but yeah, so, so I, I, um, I worked with Boo for anywhere from 10 months to a year, um, and loved it, loved every second of it. But I started my studio at the same time, started working with smaller local bands and just kind of grew from there. Tell us about Royal Studios because there's quite a history there, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, high, high records, um, in Royal Studios was, uh, it's actually built in in South Memphis, kind of, and it's built in a in a silent movie theater, which was a silent movie theater. So the the whole floor is sloped where the tracking area is, which is kind of fun and difficult at times. Hmm. Um, but working there was was pretty awesome. So all of Al Green's hits came from there. That was like the big records that were coming out of of Royal at the time, and then it just progressed from there. Yeah. Um, John Mayer recorded some stuff from Continuum there. Um, Keith Richards, Robert Plant. I mean, Bruno Mars, Uptown Funk. Well, really, Mark Ronson, right. Uptown Funk with Bruno Mars uh, was recorded there. And all of or most of the Uptown special was recorded there recently. And so it, it has a ton of history. And you walk in, you know, you know, those older studios that you could just feel the history. Yeah. And, and, and it, it's that exactly as soon as you walk in. And what I didn't know is like me and my wife walked down uh, after we were married at our wedding ceremony. We walked out to Al Green. <laughs> um, I'm so in love with you. And it, it, it was it was cool, like meeting Al Green at Royal, working wow. at Royal and all that history. Like it was just it was full circle. Um, Did you learn uh, a thing or two just about groove and, and funk and just making groovy music? Yeah. Well, I, I learned that basically if, if you're not a good musician, they'll send you home. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like serious, like they're still very old school. Um, and you, and and you they, still don't get to wash the bathroom. Oh yeah. I still, still. Um, but, uh, but they're very old school in, in how they approach things. Like you don't overdub hardly at all. You do full live tracking if at all possible. So like they'll have the backup vocalist up in the loft. They'll have the main vocalist in the vocal booth. They'll have the drums and the guitars all going at the same time. Um, nice. And like if if like instead of going back to a, like a second verse and then going forward, like he'll just start the whole session all over again and just keep recording. And you'll start from the beginning of the song and go all the way through it. And my band was was fortunate enough to be able to record there after I worked there. And we did that. And it was like the, the difference in the life of the record is is in that hmm. versus just doing tons of overdubs and, um, you know, just doing it kind of raw. But it sounds amazing if you have a lot of chemistry. Did you guys have live horn sections going as well, too? That sort of thing? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so they would. Yeah. So we would like I mean, he has, you know, blocked off sections where he can move stuff around and, and you would have live horns going at the same time as even the drums, like the, they would be right beside the drums, but have a block in between them. And oh, I mean, it's all together. Yeah. So it's a big enough space that, you know, putting up a gobo can kind of isolate a couple of, of instruments from each other. Exactly. With very minimal bleed, actually. That's wild. That's exciting. Yeah. I, I, I occasionally record in spaces that are that big. A lot of the times I'm recording in much smaller spaces, but I like that idea a lot. Yeah. All right. So um, you were at 
Royal Studios with Boo Mitchell, and then you opened your own place, Rise Studios. And tell us a little bit about the experience of opening your own studio. So my own studio, it's a home studio. It's uh, in my, it's in a bonus room above my, my garage. It was unfinished. So I finished it all out and treated it and everything. And at the time, you know, I didn't know a ton. I had a handful of stuff, like a very cheap, interface and and just a handful of mics that were pretty cheap. And I was just like, Hey, do you want to record? <laughs> and yeah, I became a part of the recording Academy and tried to network through there and, and work with local bands. But since I was in a band, a local band that helped tremendously mm-hmm. in networking. So, you know, I did our record and actually charged for our record, which is pretty funny, <laughs> nice. but, but then because people liked our record and we were playing with like bands that were very similar to us, they were like, Hey, can we, can you do our record? So it just kind of blossomed from there. And then I would like get on freelancer.com and do a ton of little projects in between doing all those records and which led to the nursery rhymes. Oh Um, yeah. Right on. Tell us about the nursery. Well, before you tell us about the nursery rhymes, I just wanted to ask one last thing about the transition from Royal to your home studio. Are there some points that you feel feel like you were able to carry over as similarities from a big studio to a home studio? And then are some things you felt like you needed to let go of in sort of in terms of recording methods and techniques? Yeah. So at the time when I started my studio, I didn't have any outboard gear at all. So the way I was able to get around that was basically engaging a plugin on a track. And even though it's not coloring the sound on the front end, I was able to still like basically do it as if I was at Royal, um, just on the track. Um, but Mm -hmm. I had to let go of that. Sadly, the live tracking element. Um, there was a couple of bands that I worked with that like I would have, it's a big enough space. It's, it's 10, 10 and a half feet wide by 35, 35 feet long. And so it's a big enough space to where I can set a drum set in the back and maybe have one, like a bass player or something going at the same time, yeah. but I was limited to eight channels. So I, you know, had to Jimmy rig ways to get better sounds and stuff. And I was able to get a lot of cool sounds, but you know, because of the drums and the loudness and everything, it's, it was kind of hard to get good monitor mixes, mm-hmm. um, especially for artists that are very finicky about their monitor mix. Mm-hmm. Um, you mean like all so, of them? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so, so I was able to do some live tracking with a few instruments, but then I was just, I gave up. I would basically just kind of rearrange my, my method and send me rough mixes up front of the song to the BPM you want the song. And then I would have the drummer, you know, play with that. And then we would just overdub from there, um, nice. throughout, but, but yeah, so that was kind of a hard transition and that's what I'm working back towards. So I've acquired a lot of outboard gear now. Um, and I'm building that, that large production studio, like we talked about now. And so, so I can get back to that big live tracking uh, element again. Do you find that in a space like your, you said it was about 10 and a half by 35. So I'm guessing it's sort of the attic space that just, you know, the length of the house. Yeah. Um, do you find that in spaces like that, you prefer to deaden down the room a little bit more and that that makes it work better for you or keep it kind of live or somewhere in the middle? Yeah, no, I love deadening it. So I have, I have not shag carpet, but it's, it's pretty darn thick. Um, (laughs) I have, I have carpet, um, with extra thick foam underneath it for the residents in the garage. Um, I have acoustical space. So, so my space is, so the, the wall comes up like four and a half feet and then it goes up to the pitch of the roof. Right. So it's, it's literally like a triangle in here, but I like deadening it almost completely and then using processing on the back end to get that big boominess or the, the reverb or anything like that. And sometimes I'll, I'll put some room mics up, but, but with a space like this, you know, that's obviously pre-built that you have no control over really. I would rather get rid of the resonance and the weird frequencies and stuff and then just add it all back in if I can. Yeah, and, and Rockstars, um, if you're thinking about that, and it's a reminder that in smaller home studio spaces, you know, you may want to go towards control and, and deadening a sound a little bit. Although watch out, because sometimes you can over deaden and all you're ending up doing is taking all the high end out, but not the low end. But a, totally. a quick and easy way to deaden a space before you get fancy and put up panels and think about 
things that feel like design is just put a lot of stuff in there. Just bring up a couch, stick it in there, you know, put up blankets, put, you know, take, bring up a, a rack of clothes and hang a bunch of clothes on it, you know. If you got room, that'll really help tighten up the sound a lot. So tell us about the, the nursery rhyme thing, because that's, that's a real trip. And I heard some of your tracks, you shared your YouTube links with me. And it is, um, you know, I, I, a fair question is, uh, and I say this kind of jokingly a little bit, but is this the music you set out to make in the first place? <laughs> so, no. Um, I actually did a post the other day on Instagram. and was like, I never knew that I would make a living doing nursery rhymes or cartoons, <laughs> and but I love doing it now. I don't touch them as much as I used to because we are doing such a bulk amount for these large stuff, and, and it's all I can do just to manage it. Mm-hmm. But um, I still do some ever so often. But yeah, it's definitely not something I thought I would be doing and not the music I really wanted to create. But, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. When you when you look back and... And when you're doing, you know, 60 a month, when you do over a thousand songs, you get really good at writing, right? Right. <laughs> you get really good at writing melodies and, 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 and alternative melodies and, and really creating structure of songs. So like after that, uh, after a few months of that, I was writing a song for a band and writing a song actually for a TV show or a feature film. And it only took me a day to do a whole, like write the song from scratch write the lyrics, write the melodies, record all the instruments and mix it, master it, send it off. It got picked for the feature film. And, but, but I wouldn't have been able to like, that would have taken me several days to map it out before, but now, you know, I can pump out a song in a day. It's um, that whole testament to a large body of work too. And and, really bringing your skill set up. So on these uh, nursery rhymes, uh, some of the stuff I heard sounded very in the box and digital, Um, the recordings, and then um, you had voices over them and you were writing the words, the the rhymes themselves. Uh, But it was like still full arrangement. You were really like doing a full band arrangement and having to arrange a song so that it had sort of a beginning, a middle, and an end and dynamic and stuff. Right, right. Yeah, we always do that. Um, But since the target market is three to five-year-olds, you know, (laughs) they don't don't care you put in a a diminished fourth, you know, (laughs) they don't care that you put in a a major minor seven or or something in a, in a track or like leading chords are not something that they care about. So like you, you literally like keep it super simple Yeah. and, and as long as it gets them off the couch, they don't care. Um, so as long as it's poppy and upbeat and energetic, like that's, that's the main focus, not necessarily the arrangement, but the arrangement is very, very important uh, because you are using anywhere from four to six MIDI instruments, but you need it to sound pretty decent. So like I try to stay away from horns. <laughs> um, I try to stay away from certain sounds, um, use a lot of triangle on xylophone and bell and stuff, some kids sound stuff. But yeah, it's, it's definitely a, an art form that I was terrible at at first. And thankfully the company was very patient with me, <laughs> but now it's just kind of a machine. Okay, now without necessarily going into too many specifics, but just generally speaking, how did you go from not doing that to having a connection and then getting this great opportunity and doing it? And what advice would you have for somebody else who's thinking, man, I sure would love to have an opportunity to make a bunch of songs for some company? Yeah, so that process was, I got on freelancer.com. At that time, you know, I was just trying to fill in the gaps. So like, you know, I mean, you know, Lish, like you do a record, one month and, or like maybe in a week, and then you have a three month stale period where you don't do anything. Never, <laughs> and, not me. Yeah, I know. Right. <laughs> um, so I needed something to fill in the gaps and I got on freelancer. I would take, you know, $30 projects, hundred dollar projects, but I found this nursery rhyme thing and I was like, you know, I don't want to do nursery rhymes, but it'll pay the bills. And, uh, it was super, you know, cheap, uh, for me to do it. And I just bid on it and he had me do five songs. And he paid me for it. It wasn't a lot, but, uh, he was like, okay, cool. Well, here's the rest of the payment. I, you know, you did a decent job and I'll, I'll keep in contact with you. Well, I didn't hear from him for like a year and a half. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, my band started getting bigger and we started touring and, but then when we were on our way either to Europe or on our way back from Europe on tour, I got an email from him a year and a half later. 
and was like, Hey, are you still up for nursery rhymes? <laughs> and I was like, sure. I mean, sure, you know, I mean, you not. don't make a ton of money on tour <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, I'll, you know, I, I can do it from anywhere and, and, uh, you know, I'll start doing it again. And so he sent me a batch of, you know, 10 and I, I, you know, get it to, got it to him on time and hit deadlines. And then he sent me a batch of 20 and then he sent me a batch of 30 and then he sent me a batch of 60 and I was doing 60 a month by myself for a while, um, creating the music and hiring vocalists to sing the stuff. And then he was like, man, we gotta, you know, we gotta do a lot more. So I started wow. hiring people and it, over the last year, it's just turned into, you know, anywhere from six to 800 songs a month <laughs> with 23 different projects with, but, it, but, but the main, so for the rock stars, this is the main advice. Be consistent. Yeah. Be consistent. Be on time. You need to under promise and over deliver every single time. So I always tell them, so if it takes me a week to get something done, I always tell him two weeks. And when I get it done in that week, he's like, oh man, you got this done so quick. I'm like, yeah, man, I just had some extra time and, and I was able to get it done. And, you know, little does he know, you know, I have eight people working on it. Um, yeah, right. But, yeah. but that's, but that's the main thing is, is being consistent, which led to this one company that I was working with this one guy doing, you know, 60 songs a month. We ended up doing it for 14 different countries. And then he, he partnered me with his business partner who owns the 500 top YouTube channels in the world and are constantly picking up more channels. Hmm. And I was like, Whoa, that's crazy. <laughs> but then they got me into cartoons and started doing sound effects and sound bed music for cartoons and all this crazy stuff and finding vocalists. And it just kept on leading to more stuff because I was doing a great job for him. And then I started doing a great job for him, this other company. And it just kind of blossoms and, and grows. And, and I've been growing so fast that I almost can't keep up now. So now what's the time frame from this <laughs> sort of, you know, going on freelance.com to almost can't keep up? It's literally been, well, I mean, besides the year and a half of hiatus where he didn't talk to me, it was literally a year. Wow. Um, yeah. So going from doing nothing, being on tour to being in the studio full time and just being consistent, I went from, you know, a very average studio income a year to six figures just from his stuff. Wow. That's amazing. In a year. So... That's a, but it's that's being really consistent. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so uh, some questions that pop into mind. First of all, you talk about, you know, 30 nursery rhymes, 60, then 800. And you know, the first <laughs> question is like, wait a minute, isn't there a limited supply of nursery rhymes? You know, so yeah. uh, you guys are obviously changing things up a little bit, I imagine. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I've done personally, I've done five arrangements, rearrangements of Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, you know, and, and just changing up the lyrics. So like, it'll be the, the same lyric for the first verse. And then I'll rewrite the second, third, fourth verse to where it's, it's something different. And so like for, there was one song that I did where I created a story. Oh, three blind mice. So I did three blind mice, changed it from the, the, the woman cutting their tails off. Cause three and five year olds don't need to hear that. <laughs> um, <laughs> To, to something different. And then I created a story with the next three verses that the animation's going to. So I'm literally the foundation for all the animation and creating the, the storylines basically of all these animations. And I'm changing it up all the time, but it's still, it's just nursery rhymes that are in the public domain and we can do an unlimited amount of rearrangements with different music and everybody has different interpretations. So I could have you know, 20, I could have an order of, of 20 twinkle, twinkle, little stars have 20 different guys do it and have 20 different interpretations of that song That's that wild. are still energetic, peppy and upbeat. That's wild, man. Well, what yeah. a trip. And then rock stars to give you some indication of the reach of this. I went to go look at a couple of the YouTube channels that Kirk sent me the links to. And Let's just say that there were quite a lot of views on these videos. <laughs> now, I, I get excited when I've got a thousand or a couple of thousand views on something I'm like, hey, that's pretty cool, you know? And, and I've done some mixes for 
bands at Bonnaroo and my Haybell studio that have, you know, 150,000, you know, going on towards 200. And that's really exciting. And then I, I feel like a super rock star. But when I go look at Kirk's videos and they literally have 65 million views on a nursery rhyme, that's just mind boggling. I guess there's a lot of kids in the world, you know? Uh, yeah. Yeah. And we're in the technology age and also in the information age. So like now with iPads and iPhones and, and all sorts of different stuff, like you basically just go onto YouTube and these companies just have compilations of an hour worth of nursery rhymes and animatics to where you just start it and it just keeps playing. And your wow. kid is basically entertained for an hour with different nursery rhymes and animatics. Amazing. Amazing. Right. And that's what I was going to say. There's nobody who really appreciates and knows repeat listens like kids do. Oh, yeah, exactly. Every, every day listening to the same playlist, probably. Yeah. For a while. Well, that's a trip, man. All right. So that kind of brings us, you know, gives us a really great picture of your background. Um, I also like to ask guests to share an inspirational quote on the show. And you already said, you know, uh, under promise and over deliver. And sometimes I'm reminded that under promise kind of means like overestimate at the same time, yes, you know, totally. which is a hard one for me to remember to do as well as probably a lot of people. But have you got any inspirational quotes you'd like to share with us? Yeah, man, most of my success is just, and, and this is something I, I tell anyone from my interns to, to my coworkers and is never stop learning, work hard and be prepared. Nice. Because you never know when the Foo Fighters or Maroon 5 will come knocking on your door and you will want to be ready. Yes, indeed. Because it, it, in the music industry, as, as you well know, Lish, you pretty much only get one shot at, at a lot of things. And some of your biggest clients, some of your biggest opportunities, that door will open one time for you and you better be ready for it. Because if you're not, that could completely alter the path of your career <laughs> and set it off five more years. Yeah. Um, but if you're ready, if you're never stop learning, if you're mixing a song a day or you're mixing a song a week or you're engineering records for free or whatever, like being prepared, knowing your stuff, man, it's, it's so important and working hard too. Yeah. I've been in those 22 hour sessions where you're at Royal <laughs> and you go in at, at, at 10 a.m. And, and you come out at, at 8 a.m. the next day. <laughs> and then you got to be back at 10 a.m. <laughs> so you basically take a shower, you take an hour nap and you're back at the studio and you do another 22 hour session. Man, that kind of stuff you got to be ready for. It would um, make you, you almost might opt for eight hours of sleep and wash the, clean the bathroom, you know? Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I definitely don't do that right now and I n will never do that. Um, yeah. I I'm very, very keen on my time, but. Well, let's talk but, about that for a sec. Cause we didn't really get to tell everybody that, um, you have gone through, you know, chapter of your life where you were able to put in the 22 hours and, and just work insanely. And it was probably a good time for you to do it. But recently, You've had a real life change. Would you like to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So I, I me and my wife had our, our first child. He's 11 weeks old. And um, my wife is a dentist. And so she she's going to work now and at a dental office. And, and my son is, I'm basically taking care of my son wow. while my wife is at work well, all that's day. Amazing. And, so he's napping now while you're on this interview. I better hurry uh, up and get to the point. Uh, no, no, you're fine. He, you're fine. So she is off today. She's taking care of him. So that's nice. But, uh, but yeah, he just mainly sits right behind me right here. Uh, I feed him, change him and stuff. But when he's happy, he's watching me send emails. He's watching me do all sorts of stuff, uh, mixing songs. And I can tell he's kind of like my, my gauge to where a song should be now, because if he's not like happy and up and and going, then I know the song's not where it needs to be yet. Interesting, interesting. <laughs> All right, well, keep the speakers down. Keep that volume down. Yeah, totally. Uh, uh, I always mix low. Yeah. Um, okay, awesome, dude. So now you've got, you know, you're, you're entering that stage of your life where you really got to strike a balance between work and family, and that's awesome. Let's jump forward a little bit. Tell us about, uh, you know, you've had a lot of great successes. Tell us about more of a failure for you in the studio. You know, um, not everything is, is always working out, I'm sure. 
Yeah, no, things don't always work out, um, especially when you have a family and you start a studio and you have three months of nothing. Um, <laughs> your wife will stress out and, and, and it, it discourages you. But probably one of the most important failures, I had something down, but I, I think this is even better now that I think about it. One of the most important failures that, that set me back and I learned from was when I first started I was networking and I was, I was working in the recording Academy, trying to find like people who, who are at where I wanted, wanted to be. Mm -hmm. And I went to this guy's studio. He was, he was building a new studio and I, I was like, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll help you build it. And yeah, I'd love to learn from you and stuff. And he would ask me, okay, well, what's a, what's a figure eight microphone? I was like, what are you talking about? And he was like, okay. So I was literally there for 15 minutes. And he asked me about a handful of things. And, and after it, he was just like, look, buy a book, Engineering 101, and then come back to me. I nice. was like, uh, and I, I was embarrassed. I was thrown back. I didn't have any information. I couldn't BS my way through that because I had no idea what he was talking about. Yeah. And that set me back, but it, it motivated me to learn which is why I say never stop learning, work hard and be prepared because that was an opportunity that I could have used to my advantage, leveraging that and learn from this really great engineer who did stuff like Smash Mouth in the 90s, who did all sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. But I never got to learn from him because I didn't even know what a figure eight pattern was in a microphone. Yep. Uh, yeah. But now I do. <laughs> and we're really good friends now, but, but at that point in time, four years ago, I had no idea. And he called me out and was just like, look, you need to learn. And I did. And um, now, you know, I've got a buddy who's been on the, the podcast with us too, Chris Graham of chrisgrahammastering.com. And you may have met him with us at NAM, Summer NAM. But uh, he did this great post for, for social media where it was a picture of a bunch of different microphones. And then to demonstrate their pickup patterns, he put a donut right above them. <laughs> so there was a figure eight donut <laughs> and a round donut. And then there was like a heart-shaped donut. It was great. Man, I bet he had to eat all the sections where it wasn't like where it was dead or whatever. Yeah. What, well, a, what yeah. a terrible post. <laughs> it, was, it was awesome. I think it went slightly viral. I don't know if it had 65 oh. million views, though. Hey, I, that's <laughs> luck, man. That's not me. I don't know, man. I saw that channel. They were all about that big. That, I, you know, that was probably the biggest one that I saw there. But, um, you yeah. know, a, a, a failed video might have been, what, 5 million views? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Didn't give as much ad revenue. All right. So um, let's see. That is awesome. That's great advice. You know, learning, always be in the learning stage. That's why I created this podcast. That's why I'm here. I almost didn't even anticipate how much I would learn just by hosting 100 episodes of a podcast. Uh, but right. it's, it happened and it's been great for me and great for my records. So Rockstars, I encourage you to always keep learning. And let's jump right forward to the, uh, the main topic of the podcast today and do a little learning. So Kirk has put together a great book for you, and I'll let you explain it better than I can. But essentially, Kirk's going to teach us four steps to 1.4 million Spotify plays in a year, which is a great topic. And it's obviously geared towards the artist in the band. But as people in the studio, we all want to know this stuff too. And, and I think that the topics that you teach in this book are very, very relevant to growing a studio as well. Roswell Pro Audio brings you microphone design that is out of this world. Endorsed by a growing list of artists and producers like Phil Collin of Def Leppard, Ross Hogarth, who's recorded Van Halen, Ziggy Marley, and the Doobie Brothers, and Super Dupes, working with Drake, Mary J. Blige, and Eminem. These are all rock stars that have discovered just how great Roswell microphones sound. Check out the Mini K47, which uses a capsule modeled on the one in the vintage U47 at a street price of only $299 or the beautiful Delphos condenser microphone with a capsule tuned like the vintage U67 with great clarity and far lower noise at a street price of only $899. In fact, you are hearing my voice right now on the beautiful Delphos microphone. These mics are carefully crafted by hand and immediately feel good even before you plug them in and hear how great they sound. 
These are well-built microphones that will last you and your studio a lifetime of great recording. Check out more audio examples of these awesome mics at roswellproaudio.com. So first question to you, Kirk, is how do you know this stuff? How do you know about 1.4 million Spotify plays in a year? Yeah, so um, one of the bands, uh, which is actually the the most fun record I've one of the most fun records I've ever done uh, was with the band Camino. Um, they're a, they were called Camino, and then they put the band in front of it because of other issues. But but the band Camino was a band that my band would play with a lot. They started about six months after us, mm -hmm. and. Uh, they were just like, you know, we, we love your guys' record. They loved our music. They loved how we, you know, played and, and entertained during our shows. And, and they basically came to me and was like, you know, we want you to produce our record and we want you to engineer it. And so I, I did. And uh, they started a, a Kickstarter or a Indiegogo account and got the funding and, and we put it all together. And, and then over a year they blew up and their, their Spotify plays just kind of took off and got on playlist here, playlist there. And they just kind of grew exponentially over that year. Nice. And now they're, they're, they have a new EP out and they're doing great. They're, they're just exploding and are definitely on the rise. Um, so this, but, would, this is a band that came to you because they liked what you were doing in the studio. You made a record with them. And then they went on to see a lot of great success in that that first year. Yeah, yeah. Okay, definitely. awesome. I'd say that resonates with a lot of us, you know, as as studio owners, as producers, um, wanting to work with artists. We want to make a great record, but we also want that band that we just made a record with, that we poured our heart and our work into, to go off and succeed, so that like this is headed somewhere. Exactly, exactly. And and you know, I n I never really knew what that looked like. Obviously, I, I, this was the second record I ever did. Um, Nicely and, done, man. And it, uh, the first record being my bands and like just experimenting and getting the best sound I could. And then, you know, doing this record's band or this band's record with the band Camino, it was a lot of experimenting, which is why I thought, I think it's one of the, like I said, the most fun records I've ever done just because we were running snares through pedals and, and doing all sorts of stuff. I mean, it, yeah. it, it was really cool, but, but yeah, so I, I saw that and then I sat down and really analyzed how they did that, um, which is how I put together this four steps to 1.4 million Spotify plays. And like you said, it, it really does resonate even in the studio. It's, it's the business side, but also the exposure side to really any business and how you can do that, and it translates to any industry uh, yeah. for the most part. No, I can't tell you how many times an artist or a songwriter comes to me as the studio owner, as the producer, and sort of wants advice far beyond the studio itself. You know, well, what do we do with this record? How do we succeed with this? How do we go out and do stuff? So I think it's very relevant. Yeah. Yeah, no, totally. Um, and I love putting it together too. I know more about this band than I think they do because <laughs> <laughs> of all the research that I did. But, um, but yeah, so, so I put this together and it's going to be free for your fans. Awesome. And, but yeah, I guess we'll jump in. And, yeah, let's, uh, let's jump in and let's let Rockstars uh, actually, Kirk has also created a link for you to go download this free book. So we can mention that now. We'll mention it again later. And of course, I'll include it in the show notes too, so you can click through. Yeah, totally. So I created an exclusive link just for you rock stars um, at Rise Recording, R I S E Recording.com dash R S Rock Stars. Um, that's Rise Recording.com slash R S Rock Stars. And you're going to be able to get this but also four ways to save time in the studio and a Pro Tools template that has all of my basically plug-in setup and, and track setup and routing and everything, uh, how I save time in the studio on sessions, awesome. whether it be mixing or recording. So Awesome. Well, let's go and We got time to go into kind of an outline of what's going to be in the book so we can let people know about it. What's the first? Uh, we got four. There's actually even more than four, it seemed like, in there. But uh, let's start <laughs> with the, fir the first topic. Yeah. Yeah. The first topic is great songs. You, <laughs> you can't get anywhere without great songs. You could have a $4 million budget 
and put in tons of work. But if you don't have great songs, it's not going to resonate with anyone. Yeah, yeah all it's, you did was spend forty four million dollars. Exactly, exactly. And 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 that's something that uh, like Rick Stone, who's a, a radio basically promoter, the top one in the last twenty five years, who like put Fall Out Boy on radio and Adele on radio and all these people, like he says, like, yeah, you can pay me $50,000 and I'll put your song on the radio for two weeks, but it's only going to be on there for two weeks. <laughs> you, you gotta, you gotta do stuff and, yeah. and put yourself out there and, and have great songs. You need great songs. Yeah. Um, yeah. and, and you don't necessarily have to have a multi-million dollar studio. The success comes from great songs. Uh, I can, I, it's been proven. I recorded the band Camino's record in my attic with literally five microphones and no outboard gear and just experimenting and putting it all in. And it blew up over a year's time. That's impressive. Not the greatest, not the greatest record in the world, engineering wise, great but songs it worked. can go beyond that. That's the beauty of great songs, right? Is that you can actually uh, great songs can make up for deficiencies in other aspects of a process. Totally, totally, and and that's where I go with that that first step is is great songs and and you know keeping it simple and singable. Great songs are singable with great melodies. You know, even if your your instrumental side is is lacking a little bit, if it has a killer melody, man, dude, you can you can do so much. Um, Gravity by John Mayer is, is a great example of, of as far as like the melody comes from almost the guitar solo right at the very beginning. Um, mm. And everyone knows it. And then it just comes in and everyone can sing that song all the way through because it's simple. It's a very iconic melody. You know, it could have been a lot different had he changed that melody up or not have the guitar solo so bright or, or you know, whatever. Yeah, I mean, um, a, a good image is imagine yourself on a stage with a uh, hundred thousand people out in the audience, and if you want a hundred thousand people to sing your lyrics and sing along with you, it better be singable. Yeah, <laughs> not yeah. everybody else has got the music skills that you do. You know, no, exactly. But but also, you know, great songs have a unique and surprising twist. You know, yeah. And I I use somebody told me by the Killers. I love the Killers, and uh, that song it has a little nugget right after the first chorus. There's this little synth interlude that's literally two bars long. And then it goes straight into the second verse and it only happens right then. I listen to the song for that specific thing. I mean, and those little things make a huge difference in, in your record instead yeah. of it being just linear all the way through. Yeah. Something um, new, something that makes it stand out against the crowd of other songs at that same time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know why, but uh, she blinded me with science from Thomas Dolby pops into my head. And you're yeah. like, you know, like, what is, the, you know, the, even the topic alone makes it different. But then also at that time, all the cool synth sounds and uh, noises and, you know, voices and effects, all that stuff made it really stand out. Right. Um, right. Okay, exactly. Cool. And, you know, you could probably make an endless list of, of songs that this reminds you of. Uh, so simple, simple song. Yeah. Great yeah, melody. Simple songs. Unique twist. And then, again, the great melody is a singable melody. It's something that everybody could really sing and remember the melody. Exactly, exactly. And, and at the end of each of these steps, I have action steps for everyone. Okay, so, cool. like, it has a list of things that you can do to create that great song. Right, and so, uh, Rockstars, we're just going into just a general outline and a breakdown right here. But in the book, it goes far more into depth with each of these topics. And there's great charts and, and visual images and, and stuff in there that really helps you grasp the concepts, especially when we get into these more business-oriented stuff coming up in the next topics. All right, so what's, yeah. what's the second theme here for uh, so 1.5? 1, 1. Th oh, no, excuse me, 1.4 million Spotify plays. I mean, we could do 1.5, you know, if you want, <laughs> just a stretch goal. But, but, but yeah, by this, this time, I'm sure it is. Right, right. Oh, it's over two and a half million, I think now. So after a year and a half. But yeah, so the second step is branding. The dreaded B word. Okay. Branding yourself. Um, this is a hard one. Oh, man, this is so hard. And, and, and most of the time, it's, I mean, you're shooting in the dark. <laughs> you have no idea what it means to brand yourself. But creative branding, what do you want your music to say visually? Man, so like Camino, basically, they, they created this room 
where their music lived in and their branding. So all their pictures, like it was of a room and they were in the room and the girl was in the room and there was roses in the room and all sorts of stuff. But their music, this first record lived in this room. Mm -hmm. And it was that space um, that you thought of when you heard their record. I go through like the 1975 and, and their branding, but not just creative branding, but consistent branding. You know, we've talked about this already, being consistent is your branding staying consistent over time? So are you using the same branding over a period of time? Are you changing it up all the time? So it, like, it's so hard to do. It is, it is. And you got to be intentional about it. Um, but after a while it becomes a beast and you just start pumping it out naturally without even thinking about it. But like the band Camino uses all black and white branding. They don't have any color in any of their pictures. And so that was a specific thing that they went through. Uh, being consistent, but then also cohesive branding. So does everything have the same branding? Does your record have the same branding that's on your Facebook profile page mm -hmm. or profile pic? Um, is your Twitter and your Facebook the same? Is your website the same? Everything on Maroon 5 sites will be the same color scheme, text type to make sure that no matter what audience they are trying to reach, everyone will see the same thing in a united front. So it's all going together. Now, let's explain a few things, or maybe I should just throw them out there, of why this can be difficult. It sounds simple. You're like, well, we've got a record cover. I mean, there it is. That's our branding, right? Yeah. But, but that's not it, right? There's more to it. Um, why is it, and where do you run into the challenges of accidentally mixing up your branding and not making it consistent? So... Part of that is, so if, if like more than one person is controlling your branding, that's one way uh, to, you mean to like break more the than one member of the band. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which we, we do go through here in a little bit, but yeah, if, if all four, five, three members, however many members are in the band, if they're all able to do posts and are doing posts consistently, but I mean, everyone has a different voice, right? Yeah. So, you know, everyone does things differently and thinks about things differently and says things differently. So the voice of the band or an artist needs to be the same. So what I would suggest is, is having one person run just the branding. So that way it is consistent um, and doesn't get all jumbled up. But one way that you can run into some pitfalls is having too much social media. And what I mean by that is, is having, you know, I mean, there's tons of like, really B level social media out there that, that you really, I mean, the thought that you need to have your music on every single website and I'll argue with most everyone on this, you don't have to have your music on every single website. You just need to get in front of people. Mm -hmm. So having it on the main ones, so like Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, YouTube, uh, Instagram, if you're on the main ones and do those very well, it's better to do those really well and have quality on them and consistency than to be on 60 different ones and just barely getting by. Yeah. And a, a reminder, uh, and part of what I was hinting at is each time you go make a channel somewhere else, let's be honest, the first thing you do is you, you start it and then you get caught, you know, putting in the name and the details and the other stuff. Mm -hmm. And then it's finally up. And then you look and you're like, oh, crap, I got to put up an image and, oh, there needs to be a header here. And, oh, well, this, how does this look? This looks different over here. And you end up not really completing it all the way, or you end up with something that kind of works for that channel, but it doesn't really look consistent with the other <laughs> channel you created on YouTube or wherever. And I, I feel like those are the places where you start to screw up your branding or yeah. you have to type the name of your thing over it. And now the font's totally different. All those kinds yep. of things, really kind of geeky, boring stuff, but it really adds up and it creates an image around your brand, right? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Totally. And, and, and that is something that we do go through. And, and um, I struggle with it now still. It's something that, I mean, we all struggle with. We really do. Uh, it's, it's not necessarily easy, but it's important. Super important. Yeah. And, and at the end of, of this section, I have a whole list of things that you can do to set out content and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. So this is a good example in your book where you've got visual images in it yes. that really help you better understand. They help me better understand what you were talking about with all this. All right. So uh, topic two there is branding. 
And some of the breakdowns of that are the visual branding. What does it look like everywhere? The fact that it's consistent across all places and that you have the same branding, which is kind of like consistent, but really it's that idea of, you know, don't have four members of the band putting out a message in four different styles. Right. Right. So, and, and that's something that we do go over here in a second. Like you can have one band member just solely using Instagram and then you can have another one just doing Twitter and another member just doing Facebook. But mm. those audiences are completely different. You can have different people doing different things, but having a cohesive branding still with a different voice is fine. As long as you're not having four different people on the same one. Would you believe uh, that some people think Facebook is for old folks like me? Can you believe that? <laughs> believe that? <laughs> oh, man. All right. So um, awesome. Well, let's keep rolling here. What's what's next on the list? This is great yeah, stuff. So step, step number three is building relationships and building. Uh, my sister says that I'm a networking fiend, but I literally, this is one of the most important things to me is building relationships. You never know who you're talking to and where they're going to be in five years from now or 10 years from now. You know, you never know mm -hmm. when Lidge is going to be, you know, a 30 time diamond platinum, you know, all, all these crazy people in the next 10 years. 65 trillion plays on YouTube. Yeah, be exactly. Nice. You never know when you're, you're the guy for the next Michael Jackson or the, the Beatles, you know? Yeah. So you treat everyone equally, but but building relationships is so important. And in this, I go through two sides because there's two sides to building relationships. You got to build relationships with your fans and you have to build relationships with the business side. So in each of these things, I go through how it looks like with the fans and then how it looks like on the business side, because they are two different hats, right? Because you can't treat the guys at the venue the same way you treat your fans. There are two different people and you treat them accordingly. But the secret number one is being there first and the last to leave. So you're the first one there and you're the last to leave. So that way you can, with the fans, you can, at the beginning, you can talk to them as they're in line for your shows. Once you get to that level where, you, you know, there's people just waiting before the doors open, go outside, talk to them, take pictures with them, play a little acoustic show while they're in line waiting. Hmm. That'll be meaningful to them. Uh, but then also being the last to leave, I can't tell you, 80% of your merchandise sales is going to be right as they're leaving. It's, it's, it's yeah. inevitable. Yeah. And you're going to lose so much money if you pack up early and leave. You're going to lose so much money. I can't tell you, I literally, it was literally like 90% of our merchandise sales. Uh, when you look back at the stats was like an hour after all the bands were done, as people were leaving as you really want to pack up, that's when all your fans are like, well, I, I, man, I forgot. I, I better get this. Right. Because right. they're done talking. They're done, you know, mingling with everyone and everyone's leaving. And they're like, man, I got to get this sticker, man. I got to get this shirt. I got to get this album because these, this band was awesome. Yeah. So I, it pops to mind a couple of different examples of that. For myself, uh, one place that I see an example of that is when there's a, a product, you know, I've, I've, sold a couple of things in and around recording studio rock stars, training stuff or events that might have a ticket to it. And same thing. There's always that last bit of sales boost right at the end when the tickets are about to go off sale, for example. So it's that last little bit you want to be there for. And another example is my brother's got a music school in Brooklyn. And what he would do during summer camp is he would actually show up early before they opened the door to the school to let everybody in. And he started this thing where they do a little jam session in a drum circle with the kids on the street. And then everybody goes in and starts the day at camp. And again, it was that being there ahead of time, that first little bit that really welcomes people in, you know, kind of creates a scene out in front of the school. So I think that this thing you're explaining applies to any aspect of it. With the studio, I imagine it's almost like, you know, the early aspect might actually be going out to see the, the band play a live show before their session in the studio and yeah. or going out and seeing them play after your session in the studio. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. And also, like, if, if you're a studio owner, if you're an engineer or something, you get there early, like two or three hours or however it takes you to set up. And you set up and as soon as the band comes, it's already set up. 
Mm -hmm. Who, Who cares if you didn't get paid for those two or three hours? It's worth having everything ready and waiting so that way when they get there, they can start and their creative process isn't, isn't really just pushed off for yeah. a couple of hours. Yeah, totally. If the session goes great, that's what people are going to take away as a memory of it. Exactly. Exactly. All right, cool. So um, what else in building relationships? Yeah. So on the business side, you know, being there first, you know, I can, I can tell you <laughs> a lot more than what I can count on my hands and feet that, you know, bands will show up late just because they don't want to be the first band to play because there's no one there. Yeah. Um, and so you're opted in to play first because you were the second band, you know, there. Um, but don't do that. When venue owners hate it, booking agents hate it, managers hate it. Every, everyone hates it when you do that. Yeah. So being there first and the relationships that you build with those venue owners, with those, those bands, bands don't like it either. So if you need to build relationships with other bands, with the venue owners, the booking agents, managers, all those people. And if you're going above and beyond, if even if it sucks for you at first, believe me, longevity is key in this business. Well, and, and, you, and the opening band might be the local band if you're the touring band. So you, you missed yeah. an opportunity to make the local band feel great and sing your praises as well. Exactly. Exactly. Which is why most touring bands will get there like early in the morning, <laughs> even when the, when the other bands are getting there at four o'clock for load in, like they'll, they'll be there early uh, mm-hmm. for the most part. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so it's so important. But then afterward, you know, after even the fans leave, talk to all the staff. They're the ones that are there every single day. And if you make them feel good, they'll remember and they'll put the word out to there or out to all the other people. Oh yeah. Um, but it's a uh, secret note. Tip your bartenders oh, too, right? <laughs> oh yeah, of course, of course. Even when you're just getting water. <laughs> um, but yeah, so secret number two, being genuine. People can tell when you're not being genuine. Man, when you're being fake, and, and I've run into that a lot, people know. People know. I, I've, as far as the fans go, like I've been with touring bands that, or like toured with bands that the other band would have tons of reach and stuff, but no one would ever like their stuff because Mm -hmm. you could tell they were being fake. You could tell they, they just weren't engaging their audience like they need to. And even at the show, like they would have awesome music and, you know, look right and, and act right. But then no one would be standing up there with them. No one would be like up at the front. They would be just kind of mingling in the back, even though they're playing a killer show. And it's because they weren't being genuine. Yeah. With the fans. Yeah. They weren't engaging them like they should. They were just doing the rock star thing. So, you know, being genuine with your fans, but also being genuine with business owners. Don't BS your way through it. I've done it. I've failed a lot doing that. <laughs> just don't do it. You can break relationships that way. And like I said, you never know when that booking agent or that manager is going to be in the next VP of Sony. You never right. know when, when someone's going to be somewhere where you need them and they knew that relationship that you built with them and burned that bridge and you already are at a loss with them. Um, another reminder too is that genuine caring relationship with somebody on the business side, um, it's, that particularly goes for somebody that you might instinctively feel is ben- below your status, whatever that relationship totally. is, because that's the place where you accidentally – you know, talk down to somebody or you treat them and, you know, brush them off. And they're the ones that are really hustling and busting their butt to try and get to a great place. And next, next time you meet them, they could be your boss, essentially. Yeah. Happens yeah. all the time. Yeah, no, yeah. It, it, it happens a lot, a lot. Um, but then secret number three is approaching everything with a servant attitude. Once I changed this mentality of being a go-getter, to a go giver, which is the book that I talk about Mm. um, in this section. Great read. But when you're a go giver and you take that same attitude of being a go getter to giving back to people with the fans, man, exponential growth, Mm. exponential growth. When you feel like you're at the point where you're giving too much away, that's where you need to be. You need to, yes, you, you may have practiced for four hours a night, five nights a week, six weeks straight, without even a show to show for it, to develop a show that weaves in and out seamlessly, but it makes your fans want more. 
Mm-hmm. 21 Pilots is a perfect example of this. I love these guys. I love their music. But that's why they went from selling out a 1,500 cap room in Memphis one year to the next year selling out the FedEx Forum that seats over 18,000 people. The FedEx in a, a year. Forum. Yeah. In a year. The same thing goes for your content. What do you know that will work really well? You Give know, it to them. This is terrible, uh, and it just shows how kooky I am. But when I think of FedEx and Memphis, I just think of the movie Cast Away. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, I know, right? <laughs> that's actually uh, how I learned that FedEx was from Memphis, was in that movie. That's how oh, out that's of funny. touch I am. <laughs> uh, it's cool. It's cool. Yeah, it's, that's like a huge part of our revenue in this. But yeah, but yeah you know, and, and that, that's so true. So, so like you, you have to be giving to your fans. Don't, don't look at it as, well, what can I get from my fans? How many records can I sell for my fans? Like, how many records can I get to my fans? Yeah. How many records can I, can I give away if I need to Prince? <laughs> so I don't know if you know this Lich, but like Prince before he passed one of his last tours, he sold, um, the way he got his record sales was like, say a ticket was 60 bucks. Well, the record was in that included price. Right. Right. So he, he sold his whole tour. He sold millions of records <laughs> because he was selling them on the front end with a ticket. Um, yeah, you know, great. but he was basically that. essentially giving his fans free records, even though it was included in the ticket price, but the fans were just like, Oh my gosh, this is so awesome. I got a free record. Yeah. Yeah. Especially you know, on a CD, you know, like that might price out at $20 or something like that. Or if it's a special edition, even higher, roll that in with the ticket price. And it's great. And I think that that was also a clever business move on his part because it, put the record sales right up the charts at the same time as the tour was happening. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it correlated so well. And, and the same thing goes for the business side, like you were saying. So every artist is trying to get paid. Well, you want to know the way to getting paid more and more and more. Every single gig is simply do what you said you would and then do more. Mm-hmm. So like if you say that you can get 150 fans to a show, get two or 300 fans to a show that, that value added, side where I talked about, you know, under promising and over delivering. Don't tell them you can get 500 fans there if you can only get a hundred there. Yeah. You know, and, and uh, yeah, that's a, that's another tough one to do because you, that's mixed with the message of really building up your confidence and being able to confidently say, I can do this, you know, we can do this. Yeah. I can, you know, you, you see that it's, it's that message you see in a movie where somebody walks in, they're like, I can do it. I can get you 5,000 sales by next week, you know, or whatever yeah. it is. And, and then that's impressive. But at the same time, you don't want to bullshit your way, um, excuse me, BS your way and, uh, and find yourself in a position where you can't actually deliver that. So I think that's just a balance that each of us has to figure out on our own. You know, it's a, you have to understand the value of being confident and also the value of, you know, under promise over deliver and just sort it out, you know, find that balance. Right. Totally. Totally. And, and, and a key thing too, is like, it's like, you got to think, yes, you're trying to get paid as an artist, but the venue is trying to make money too. Yeah. So if you understand that side as well, ask the venue, what you can do for them. Yeah. See if there's a show coming out for them that you can help them with, create a poster for the show that you're putting on and more, you know, go out of your way to stand out in their minds because a lot of artists try to see what they can get out of the venue versus what you can do for the venue. Right. So that brings us to the third topic, serve people, right? A servant attitude. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it's so important. And, and then at the end of this, I, you know, I have action steps starting to build relationships, asking your fans what cover they would like to hear you perform at your next show, all sorts of stuff. So step number three well, is let, let being me- there. Yeah. So let me just, because I was afraid you're going to go to four yet. And I just want to still talk about this servant attitude. So I think that what happens is the more you work in business, the more you work with people, the more you experience the world, especially when you're networking, you begin to realize that everybody is just like you. There's just somebody working their butt off trying to make something work. So you're the band and you're touring, going to a new city to play a show. You guys are working your butt off trying to make, put a show together and play a show. You show up in the club. The club is owned by somebody who's just been putting in years and years trying to, you know, make a successful business and make it work. Like everybody you interact with is just, just trying to make it work. 
And the sooner yeah. you realize that, the sooner you begin to appreciate how much it helps for you to have this serving attitude that says, listen, I, how can I help you do what you need to do? Yeah. And in turn, it helps you. You know, it, it, it building relationships is, I mean, you know, like we talked about at the beginning is like you could have for a $4 million budget, but if you don't have great songs, you know, you're not going anywhere, but you could have a $4 million budget. And if no one likes you, you're not going anywhere. Yeah. I mean, you, you're just not because they can stonewall you really easily. Yeah. But yeah. So building relationships, step number three, and there's a lot more stuff in there than what we just talked about. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, it's like, um, uh, I don't know why I keep wanting to talk about this, but there's almost always an opportunity to want to say, ah, oh, screw it. And like this guy's, you know, I, I don't need to worry about this guy. Or I don't need to put in extra effort or spend time or that guy's yeah. just not important or something like that. Because if you're working hard enough at your own thing, you're bound to get to that threshold of being so tired and, and exhausted or fed up or whatever. Um, even just, let's just, let's just be transparent. Last night, you know, you and I were both putting this interview together and I, you've got an 11 year old son. I know you were tired as you were getting yeah, ready for this thing. You know, I was, I was, 11, I was a little, little tired. Um, and if he was 11 years old, then it would be a little easier, but since he is 11 weeks old. Oh, did I say years? I'm so sorry. Yeah. No, it's okay. No, mine's okay. 11 years old. So, and, and I was ah. super tired because I just helped my daughter have four girls sleeping over all weekend. And we, we did the 48 hour film project. So yeah. we got no sleep all weekend and you and I, I, I'm just I'm just digging into our example because it's like right yeah, here in front of us. Totally, we we totally. just met, so we don't know each other really well yet, and we're trying to sort out, you know, uh, getting today's episode ready. And I think there are opportunities for you to have been like, man, this guy Lidge, he's being a pain in the butt. He needs this, he needs that for the interview, or me to go, who, you know, Kirk is, you know, I'm too tired to get ready for this thing. And it's those are the real opportunities where you just go, you know what? I'm going to just do it. I'm going to figure out. I know on the other end of this equation, the other person really is working just as hard as I am to try and make this work. And you, and you just get there. And then now we're here today on the interview and it's great. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and that's when, when both sides are working like that, you're on a one united front, like we've talked about. Yeah. Um, and it just, man, it's infectious. It's yeah. infectious. Yeah. So uh, your, your son is definitely not 11 years old. He's 11 weeks old. Sorry about that. Yeah. No. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's growing like a weed, but man, and tomorrow he will be 11 years old when I just blink my eyes, but man. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, all right. Back on track here. So, um, topic number four, we're hitting the fourth and final topic. Yes. Yeah. The fourth and final topic. So teamwork and having a team, mm. man, I, uh, I talked to uh, Jonathan Pondman, who was the creator of Sub Pop. He came to Memphis for a panel or something. And he came to Royal afterward, and I was able to talk to him. And he was talking about this artist that the last artist that he sat down with, he was like, you know, we can do this, 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 this for you. And, you know, what do you, what do you think about it? And it was an amazing deal. And the guy looked at it and he turned it around and, and scooted it back to him. It's like, we don't need it. We don't need it because we can do it ourselves. And that person was Macklemore and Ryan Lewis. Hmm. And they were able to, to work out some deals and stuff, but, but a lot of people know them as, you know, the guys that made a hit record without any, you know, record label That's and right. win a Grammy without any record label and all sorts of stuff. But did they do it on their own? No, they didn't. Even though they sold a platinum record, won a Grammy, toured the world and made $9 million just from one song in a year they had a team to help them. And so we go through this approach. Number one, hiring, tr hiring trustworthy people, how much, how, how important it is to hire trustworthy individuals that know what they're doing instead of trying to just do it yourself, even though it's a, a really terrible job and you're just shooting in the dark. Well, find people to do what they do best and even if you have to save up for a little bit, do it. But I even go through cheap ways to do it very well in yeah. this part. Yeah. Um, All right. So just to clarify that a little bit, Rockstars, Sub Pop Records is the very same label that broke Nirvana, never mind when they came out their record 
26 years ago in 1991. So this is an example of a record label that came to Ryan Lewis and McLemore and offered them something really valuable, but they had already built a team that could do everything themselves that they needed to do. And that's why they were able to turn down the offer from the label, right? Exactly. Exactly. And, and Sub Pop did end up doing some back-end stuff for them, but they weren't signed. You know, just, just little stuff that basically it was easier, you know, like not distribution. I, f- I forget who does their distribution, but, but yeah, I mean, they, they just build a team and own all their stuff. And it's, it's been pretty great. But hiring those trustworthy people, not just selling your soul to, to get a million dollar record, um, you know, that's, that's something that you can, you can do, especially now with all the independent artists out there making a living, but it's, it's all because you're hiring trustworthy people. Yeah. And you know, you wouldn't go to the, you wouldn't go to your uncle Bob for, you know, physician's advice or a doctor's advice on, you know, why you're sick. Cause he doesn't know he's not an expert in that. So hiring someone who does that for a living, hiring a graphics designer, hiring a photographer and a videographer to do what they do to translate what you're trying to translate with your music and your photos and videos is so important. Mm-hmm. How do you um, know my I, uncle Bob? You know, I, he, we met back in the day <laughs> at a NASCAR event, actually. Nice. Yeah. Um, it was he, was selling, he was bringing you some moonshine. Uh, yeah. So, so yeah. So, so that's how I know your uncle Bob. Um, All right, cool. So trustworthy people, and this is important. Yeah. And I think part of that is saying a really good message is just trust your gut. Your gut yeah. is always going to let you know if somebody you're thinking about working with is somebody you feel good about and feel like you can trust. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and the same thing goes with managers, booking agents, entertainment attorneys. One bad, one bad contract can ruin your career in the music industry. Mm-hmm. And I've I've seen it firsthand. It, it's, they're hard to get out of, you know, as, and you need to look over it before signing your life or your oldest child away. I mean, mm-hmm. you, you need to know what's going on. So even though it costs you an arm and a leg to hire an entertainment attorney up front when you're making no money, it's so worth it. So worth it. I'm going to qualify this and I'm going to also point out that somebody that is trustworthy for you and that your gut feels good about may not always be the same thing for somebody else. So I think trustworthy people, generally speaking, are just trustworthy. But there is that, you know, variation in the way chemistries work between people and and relationships that it's just a reminder, like you can get along well and work well with somebody and, you know, on the one side, somebody on the other side, but it doesn't always automatically mean that those two people are going to work well together themselves. Totally. Um, So trustworthy people. It's so important uh, hiring those trustworthy people. But, but that was approach number one. And approach number two is learning and doing everything yourself. Mm-hmm. This is what I love doing. I love learning. And we've talked about this is learning, working hard and doing so much. But this is something that the band Camino has also done very well. When I approached them to see if I could help with management duties because I was managing my band, they respectfully declined. And you know why? Because they had not hit the point where they needed anyone else. Mm -hmm. Each of them had a job to do. They were all looking for gigs, new opportunities, radio play and all sorts of stuff. But they each had a specific thing that they did and learned. So like one guy, and like we were talking about earlier, one guy would only post on Twitter and learn how to optimize 144 characters, retweets and likes, while another guy would post on Instagram and learn how to maximize likes and hashtags and comments. I need to learn how to do that myself. I know, right? So they all work together, but the whole load of the band is not on one or two people. You know, and, and I use this, this quote from Lord of the Rings. This Samwise Sam Gamgee said to Frodo Baggins in Lord of the Rings Return of the King, he said, share the load, Mr. Frodo. <laughs> it's so important that we share the load and not take it upon ourselves to be a dictator one, which is something I've done in the past. But also, you're going to get burned out. I mean, you're just going to completely burn yourself out. It's not going to be fun anymore. And two heads are better than one, but four or five heads are better than one or two. Listen, man, the first word in dictator is, oh, never mind. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Right. But that's that's a huge reason why the band Camino could make it to 1.4 million Spotify plays in a year 
was because all of them share the load equally for the most part. Yeah. So uh, um, that brings to mind this idea, if you're going to give different assignments, like somebody's doing Instagram, somebody's doing Twitter, somebody's doing Facebook, all the more important that you guys have consistently tied together a source for your branding, like you talked about earlier, where if I'm doing the Instagram and you're doing the Twitter, we both know, well, this is, I'm supposed to go over here to get the stuff that I'm posting right. on, on Twitter and Instagram. Totally, totally. And having those like Dropbox folders that have all the photos or whatever you need, keeping it organized yeah. um, is so important. Yeah, um, and so but, I won't go too deep into this, but for me, for my studio, for my podcast business here, what I've done often is I'll learn how to do this new thing first and I'll learn it pretty well by doing a few of them. And then I will immediately start writing down what my process is so yeah. that I can then turn around and offload it to somebody else and they've got the exact process and they know exactly how I like to do it. And it makes that whole transition easier, you know? Yeah, no, totally. And, and you don't totally. always have to do that, but in a lot of situations that can work as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I implement that sometimes even with me. Yeah. Um, it, you know, we all, we all have different ways of doing it, but there's still some hardcore foundation stuff that, that just works, mm -hmm. um, which is why there's this book that those are the four things that you need to do with having great songs, branding, building relationships, but also, you know, having all of this together with teamwork and having a team, those are the four steps to 1.4 million Spotify plays in a year. But then I have a bonus at the bottom that talks about how do I get on Spotify playlists, which is something that I'm not going to go over that you have to download the PDF for. Well done. Um, <laughs> and uh, it gives you nuggets, you know, how the band Camino got on playlists, how they, they went forward and, and it just kind of grew and grew and grew. I give you ways to like scripts. I give you a script specifically on how to approach these people who are the right people to approach and, and how do I approach them? Yeah. And then I also have a Spotify playlist that, that goes through and has all these songs that I'm referencing in this document oh, that great. you can follow. Cool. Very so cool. that has well, the exact things. Let's wrap up this and we'll give them the link again, but let's wrap this up by just give us a brief explanation of what would happen if you had 1.4 million Spotify plays. Why does, why does anybody even care? Okay. So uh, you know, there's a controversy out there as far as like Spotify and, you know, Taylor Swift not putting her stuff on Spotify or all sorts of stuff. So, so Spotify is very relevant. It, even though you don't get paid a ton for it, I mean, the band Camino makes, you know, a couple thousand dollars a month from their stuff. Well, that's a couple th thousand dollars a month that you weren't getting before. Yeah. It's putting gas it, in the van for sure. Yeah. Oh yeah. And, and it adds up over time. So like, if you're on Spotify getting this a month and then you're on Apple music getting this a month, you know, it, it all adds up. But so how that translates and I go through this in the PDF as well is if you're getting that amount of exposure on Spotify, you're probably also translating that over to Apple music and to other streaming sites that, that are, are putting you in front of new fans and, and discover weeklies and, and, and all sorts of stuff. So it's not, it's not just happening on Spotify. It's also happening on Apple Music and, and other streaming services that is going to add up, like I was saying, mm -hmm. which puts you in front of people. And another great thing about Spotify is that you can see where your hot markets are. Mm. So, so what they do, what the Bank Camino will do is they'll see where their hot markets are. They're like, oh, we have a hot market in New York. We didn't even know we had that. Versus trying to figure out a tour where you're just shooting in the dark and just going out and just barely making ends meet or not, not even making money at all and spending money in places you shouldn't be really, mm -hmm. but you can see exactly where those hot spots are. So they'll go out to California and hit a few places on the way that are hot spots and the same on the way back. They'll go up to New York and hit hot spots on the way and on the way back. And it just builds, builds, builds the, those hot spots to be even bigger and puts you in front of more people. Okay. Very interesting. So a couple of ideas popping into mind. One is if it's a hot spot, you maybe didn't know you had, you maybe didn't also play there before. Imagine how much easier it is to land a gig in a town 
where you can show that you've got 1.4 million plays or whatever the high number is that you are at. So that's got to be a a boost for a band who wants to book a gig in that town. But it immediately occurs to me too, as the studio and the production company team, whatever, now you have an idea if if the band that you were working with has got a hotspot in a particular town, hey, maybe that's a great place to start running your Facebook ads for your production company and your studio if you want to bring in a band from out of town to come work with you. Exactly. Exactly. It, it, it's twofold. It really is. You can see so much information from from just that little bit on both sides, um, right. you know, which leads to more record sales and, and all sorts of stuff. Well, that's very cool. Well, um, tell us again where what the link is. Yeah, so the link to, to get this PDF to also get four ways to save time in the studio and a free Pro Tools template that has all my go-to plugins and all sorts of stuff um, will be at rise, R-I-S-E, recording.com slash RS Rockstars. That's riserecording.com slash RS Rockstars. And you're going to get all of that stuff that's going to be exclusive to you. Those That Pro Tools template and, and that studio time PDF is going to be just for you guys, just for the rock stars. Awesome, dude. Well, thank you so much for doing that. I think in the interest of time, because we've dove in so deep, we're just going to skip the jam session for this episode. And we'll just uh, kind of wrap up around that. Let our listeners know how they can learn more about you and find you and uh, and stay connected with you. Yeah, totally. So you can go to riserecording.com, shoot me an email. Um, you can also find me on Twitter um, at Kirk Teachout. Um, also Instagram at Kirkus Maximus 45. That's my gamer tag on Xbox as well. If you yes. want to <laughs> add me on there, uh, we'll play some Halo together. But uh, but yeah, so. That's, I mean, that's pretty much the main places that, that you can find me as Twitter and Instagram. Awesome. Yeah, so Rockstars, uh, just just reach out to him for games during nap time because that's going to be the only time he can actually play with you for a minute. <laughs> but exactly. You'll, you'll be taking a nap yourself now for at least a few years. Uh, maybe. Uh, <laughs> awesome. Um, thanks again, Kirk, so much for joining us on Recording Studio Rockstars. Been a blast to talk to you. Great story, man. A lot, a lot of cool stuff you've done. And thank you so much for creating the four steps to 1.4 million Spotify plays in a year. That's a great topic. It clearly applies to everything we're doing in business and creativity. So um, a lot of great stuff in there. Rockstars, a reminder, you will get the link to that at riserecording.com slash rsrockstars. And I will have that in the show notes. If you're on your mobile device, you can just simply click through and you should see a little link there. You can hit with your finger. It'll take you right over to it and get signed up. All right. So thanks so much, Kirk. I look forward to hanging out again soon. And uh, I don't know whether it's Memphis or Nashville where I see you next. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And thank you so much for having me on the show. My pleasure, man. We'll see you around the studio, dude. Yeah. All right. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444, and I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Music.